attention, please. Thank you for coming. We're very fortunate this evening to have with us Mr. Neely Fuller, who has written a book whose, let me read it so I get it right, <laughs> whose title throws me as, as well as some of the books. It's called a textbook, workbook for thought, speech, and our action for victims of, racist, of racism. That's white supremacy. Now, anybody who's not such a victim can leave now. <laughs> but anyway, as always, it's, it's a subject that's vital to us. So we have a man who has put his mind to it for some years and put it into a wonderful book. So I hope you're welcome, Brother Neely Fuller. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Richardson. Now, can you hear me? Basically, all the way back, can you hear me? Okay. I want to talk about maybe the ingredients in this book, which I put in there. And I'm the author of the book. I had a little problem getting it out, of course, it's sort of a homemade draft copy. And I gave it a title some years ago called The United Independent Compensatory Code System Concept. That doesn't mean anything at all. <laughs> so you look at the subtitle. I mean, it means something, but it only means something to me if you haven't heard me talk about it. The subtitle is a textbook, textbook workbook for thought, speech, and or action for victims of racism. I describe racism as white supremacy. I describe white supremacy as racism. And I say a lot of unorthodox things in this book because in order to fight racism, or eliminate it rather, not just fight it, but actually eliminate it, you have to use unorthodox methods. Now what does that mean? That means it's something that's not been tried before. Now, a lot of things have been tried before, but whatever has been tried before hasn't worked, including what's in this book, because it hasn't been tried before. We only know what will work when it works, and what doesn't work when it doesn't work, trial and error. And I'd like to say in connection with that, okay, why bother with racism? Let's just start off with that. Uh, Shouldn't we, t shouldn't we be talking about drugs and poverty and all like this? Well, I have a basic premise, and that's on the back of the book. And somewhere on the back it says, As long as racism exists, anything said or done by people that is not intended to help eliminate racism and help to produce justice is a waste of time and energy. Also, I say all through the book, that if there's any problem on this planet among people, you're not going to solve it until you eliminate this phenomenon called white supremacy. I don't care what kind of problem it is. Now, a lot of people say, well, no, the problem is capitalism. Okay, we're mostly into that back in the 1930s and in the 40s and then later in the 1960s. Depends on what you define as capitalism. Some people say the problem, well, is the Soviet bloc. And then you got all kinds of terms that float around like apartheid. you got to watch all the words. What is apartheid? Same thing that I started off talking about, white supremacy. Scrap apartheid, call it white supremacy. I sometimes have talked to Dr. Frances Wilson. Some of you may have seen her on television. I talk to her quite frequently. And... Uh, color theory of press theory of color confrontation and that is we talk about you nail everything down to simple terms that are truthful so you don't get into a lot of abstract terms or terms that mean the same thing like colonialism apartheid neo-colonialism oppression war on poverty affirmative action See, all these myriad of terms, 
civil rights. Stop and think about the term civil rights. All rights are civil. Have you ever heard of an uncivil right? See, they give you terms, the racists do. They give you words that really don't explain anything. This is why when they start, say apartheid, you should say, and this book is supposed to tell you what to do about situations, how to say things, things to say, things not to say, things to do, things not to do. So you start off saying things like white supremacy is racism, racism is white supremacy. Then you say some pretty outlandish things that you can make fit. You can say there's only one race. And then you don't come up with that cliche saying the human race. There's only one race, and that is the white race. Black people do not need to be a member, be members of a race. When did you learn that you were a member of a race? Somebody told you this. You weren't born thinking you were a member of a race. And where did it come from? It came from a white supremacist, because they do the classifying. See, a white supremacist, white supremacist is an awesome force, the most awesome force in the world. Is there a religion that is stronger than white supremacy? No. White supremacy is the strongest religion on this planet. Now, everything that I say, keep up with me now, can be contested and should be. You all should get ready to start shooting stuff at me very shortly. See, because I'm going to say some pretty outlandish things. <laughs> White people, collectively, are the smartest people in the known universe. Now, you like that for apples, okay, to a group like this, see, sitting here among all these African books and whatnot. And among the white people are the white supremacists, and they are smarter than the white people who are not. And they are also the most powerful. And also, white supremacy is the most powerful religion that this world has ever seen. Nothing matches it, not Islam, not Hinduism, Judaism, Voodooism, none of it, Confucianism, none of these religions match the religion of white supremacy, because that's what white supremacy means, it means supreme, it doesn't mean four carloads of skinheads riding down the street shouting nigga this and nigga that. The white supremacists would have you believe that there go the white supremacists. All four carloads of them. <laughs> and other than that, there aren't any. We hear that there might be a couple of dozen in South Africa, but we're taking care of that. But that's who they are. Some of them call themselves Nazis or neo-Nazis. But all together, it's maybe about six or seven hundred of them worldwide. Now, if you believe that, then I got a bridge I want to say. <laughs> okay. Now, but the number is not very large compared to the number of black, brown, red, and yellow people on this planet. But they are still the most powerful people in the known universe at this particular time. And the smartest, because you can't be dumb and run a package like white supremacy on anybody this long. See, don't play them cheap. See, don't build your ego trips up on saying that they ain't nothing. They're something. And if you don't believe it, let them just walk in here and say, this meeting is over. And if you don't think it is, watch me. <laughs> See, that's what the white supremacists do. So you deal with that, and you deal with it in a strategic way. Now, people, Somebody might say, well, this guy, I mean, you know, we're just going around the circle on this one. I wouldn't be bothering to write the book if I didn't think it could be beaten. But you have to do it with strategy. And I think that we start doing what I call codifying it. In other words, that's what these words mean. You unite it, starting with the first one, in what your objective is. Now, the ultimate objective is to produce peace, in quotes. Whatever that is. Because nobody in this room, as far as I would guess, has ever known what that is. See, that's an X factor, like in algebra. Then you say you're united in producing that product. 
Okay, you're independent, meaning you are individuals, individual persons. You can't organize against white supremacy. I'm going to throw that in there. There's no way to do it because they know how to destroy a so-called, so-called, that's what it is, organization. See, there's no such thing as organizing under white supremacy if you're a victim of it. You just interrelate with people, but you're not organizing because that would be a contradiction in what white supremacy is. So you unify. That's what that united is about in your goal. But you're independent because you come and go each day as an independent person. Besides, black people have a thing that we don't want to talk to each other and tell each other what to do anyway. We're not going to listen. And it's too long way around trying to get it that way. See, running around proclaiming that black people love each other, you know, and saying brother and sister. That doesn't work either because it's a facade. It's a whole lot of talk, but it's no substance in it. So we can't wait until we love each other. We have to have a, get to this word down here, code. That's something that you adopt independently. Say, now, we're going to minimize conflicts. I'm not going to wait until I like you, not to even talk about love, because I don't even know the definition of it. Under these conditions, you can't. Under the conditions of white supremacy, there's no way to know what love is. They, not, they do not set up a system, an environment, for you to find out what it's even like. That's a process, a very intricate process of loving somebody. So much so that the word itself is used to mean anything. You say we have sexual intercourse, we call it making love. That's not what you're doing. You can't make love. So you love. But you just don't get in bed with somebody and so start working out and call it love. You got bookstores, most of the ones that you see generally, will have all kinds of shelves of what they call love stories, mostly with white people in them. And this doesn't tell you very much either. So you just throw all that out. See, and you say what you do, getting to the words now, is minimize conflict. And how do you do that? Minimize contact. See, black people got this thing about we got to get together. Most things when black people do when they get together start fighting. Now, you know that even if you try to get an organization together. By the time you get five people together, you got conflict because it's built into us to have conflict. So you start knowing this in front. So you head all that off before it gets started. So that way you start floating free, you might say, and I, I don't like that word free, but you just start floating as individuals, you might say. But you have it in your mind. Now, there is a black person, another victim over there. And my goal in this particular setting is to minimize conflict with that individual. Meaning what? The only time I'll say something to another black person is when it has constructive value. Otherwise, I don't have no business talking to you. Black people got to get in the habit, get out of that old traditional habit of just running their mouths with each other. Because pretty soon we run right into something that leads to an argument. Start off talking about a football game that happened last week and wind up it being a shootout. And the next thing you know, right this minute, all over the northwestern hemisphere, right this minute, you got that telltale symbol of the blinking light everywhere you got black people. Mostly because black people are out here killing each other, usually about some silly argument about a football game or an argument about a female or you owe me some money and most recently about crack cocaine fighting over poison that the races have put here so you minimize contact and you minimize conflict now these are this is what you call codified language it's very difficult to have conflict with somebody that you are not in contact with you have an argument under the same roof, all that needs to happen to resolve that before you have to call somebody in one of those cars with the blinking lights, is somebody break off the contact. You're going to have the contact. That's why I say you minimize it. I mean, you're going to have the conflict. 
but you minimize it by just breaking contact. See, black people should stay away from each other until they have something to say or do that's absolutely constructive. Now, let's get to the practical part. I'm going to try to jump right in after giving that frame of reference, because this is what codification is all about. In other words, code means you have a set of do's and don'ts. I cannot come to your house unless there is an agenda for being there. See, this whole thing of hanging out at somebody's house is what traditionally has gotten black people in trouble. That's what starts the Saturday night fights. I just drop in, and, hey, man, what you doing? I ain't doing nothing, man. What's happening with you? I don't know, man. Have a seat over there. This is us, everywhere, right this minute. This is what, Saturday night in the Northwestern Hemisphere? You better believe it's going on. See, from Memphis to St. Joe, all right, or wherever. Then I sit down and I say, hey, man, what you got? I don't know, man. Put on some records. I don't like that song. Put on another one. You got anything to drink? See? You got anything to snort? See? Well, you know, I'm out of that, man, so here we go. Before the night is over, chances are somewhere in that block, maybe not right there in that setting, it's going to be conflict between the people who call themselves buddies. So I'm saying the only reason I should ever come to visit you or any black person should ever visit any other black person is I came over to help you paint the wall, fix the car out back, or do some type of constructive activity. Not just sit around and chat and socialize. Because black people don't know how to do it without conflict. We have lost that art. You say, well, females don't start fighting. They do other things. Like all that vicious gossip. Can't help that if you don't have an agenda. Two females sitting down together, black females as a rule, sooner or later, if you don't have an agenda, if you don't have a reason for being there, like came up, came over to pick up some sewing, or came over to do some specific thing, like help babysit, some type of constructive labor, just sitting around, you're going to start picking at each other, even if it's just trivial things, like picking on the female that just left there a few minutes ago. See? What was she doing over here? I didn't know Helen was coming by here. Y'all still speaking? All that trivial stuff, that's destructive. The code says you shouldn't do it. And you can minimize doing that if you just stay out of pieces, people's places to stay. It's just a simple thing like that. You'd be surprised at how much that helps. I'm coming over to your house Saturday evening, and I'm coming over because you said to come over at 1 o'clock and pick up some books or to pick up a carburetor for the car. Or we're going to work on a car out back. Or I'm going to do something, fix the plumbing or whatever. That comes under this visiting. See, it's a science to visiting. you got to have a, a program for every move that we make. This is basically what I'm saying. Don't leave nothing to chance because the races do not leave, do not leave anything to chance. The white supremacists got a plan for every minute of your time. They know what I know. If I'm a white supremacist, I know what my boys and gals are going to be doing on the weekend because I got it programmed. See, I got the liquor store on the corner. I got the young black person standing out there looking for somebody to sell some crack to with his 9 millimeter all ready to go in his pocket. He's going to kill somebody before the night's over, most likely you, if your money ain't right. And this is the scene. Everything is very carefully thought out. So this is what you do about it. You minimize contact. Now, this is going to throw a whole lot of things out of kilter that the races got set up. Until I haven't talked to John in six weeks. I usually talk to him every day. But now i got something to say to him that's important, and that is constructive. So now I'll pick up the phone and call him. I don't call nobody to chit-chat. I mean, this is war, so you get on a wartime footing. That's exactly the way you look at it. Otherwise, we would just be regarded as a simple-minded people that just keep playing from generation to generation. Because we are playful. I'm kind of playful myself, even at my age. But we've got to minimize the playfulness when you are in a war. People are dying. Babies are dying. Crack cocaine. Black people are completely out of it, killing each other, getting mad about nothing, carrying guns for each other. All kinds of animosities of every type. 
We got them for each other. Can't stand each other and can't stand ourselves. So the first thing we do is just back off. And any time you meet a black person, just have something pleasant to say. I'm talking about practical things every day. I'm going to try to jump right into it because I don't know how long I have to talk. And I don't want to wear you out either. But stop the elevator insults. I'm just going to jump into everyday things. Warehouse situation or office situation. Notice how black males particularly, when you get on the elevator, Monday morning, you go right into an elevator insult if you see somebody on that elevator that you know. You know us. Here's the white people standing there, and we look back in the back there. Hey, man, where you stay last night? Your eyes show red. I know where you've been. I know what you've been doing. Yeah, man, you can't tell me nothing. Oh, man, go on, man. See, this is black people. Start cutting each other down on Monday morning. Now, the code says you just replace that with a simple flat out, good morning, when you get on, good morning, and turn around face to front. See, just regiment yourself. This is all do-it-yourself codification. Good morning. Say that to black people and white people. Good morning. Get on the freight elevator and say good morning, turn around and face the front. When you get off, over your shoulder, say, have a nice day. And all black people doing that on a Monday morning, that is phenomenal. The white people have started looking at each other and say, what? What's going on? You know, these people usually get on, I mean, insulting each other. The elevator insult, that's what I call it. See, I make this stuff up. Elevator insults. Put that in your mind. Elevator insults. See? Or you can put, change the setting, see? Bus insults. Bus station insults. See? Whatever it is, see? Because black people know how to insult each other. That is our favorite pastime. We've been doing it. It was passed on to us. That's a part of our heritage. But it's incorrect. And it's very destructive. It ruins your Monday morning. But you're not aware of it. But white people get on and say, Hi. Hi, Ned. Hi. Hi, Brian. How's Helen? Fine. And you? See? Black people. Man, you are ugly, so <laughs> Too ugly to be on this elevator with me. I sure hope this thing stops. Let me off on the next floor. <laughs> I'll see you later, man. See? Got to do that. That's what we call part of our, you know, lifestyle. And that's the thing that gets us killing each other on Saturday nights. That whole approach. See, it starts with a little, you say it's a little thing. And it's really, you know, it's supposed to be fun. But you start with that whole combative approach. See? I walk, I tell people this because about 1957, I walked into a, of course it's changing over there now because they're picking up habits. This is in so-called Japan. I say so-called because there's no such thing as countries under white supremacy. White supremacy is a country. They erase every line on the map. The lines just mean something to black people, non-white people. The lines don't mean nothing to the white races. See, the whole map is theirs. And not only that, all the stars in the universe are there. See? You'll say Africa is your home. See? Or Cincinnati or wherever. They assign homes to other people. Homelands. That's your place. So we're told. My home, wherever I want to be. That's the racist. But where was that? I? I was talking about what? Yes. 1957, I was in so-called Japan. And I walked into a barber shop. Everybody turned around. I thought it was going to be the same old thing. You know, what are you doing in here? See? And the, all the people who were cutting hair, they turned around and bowed. Ohio, 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 Ohio. See? Meaning good morning. And I took my seat up in the chair, got my hair cut. They very quietly went about their business cutting the people's hair that was in the barbershop. When I got up to leave, Everybody stopped cutting hair again. Everybody stopped what they're doing. The person who was doing things out in the back stopped and came forward and sayonara, sayonara, sayonara. So when I got out of there, I said, boy, that's weird. See? But then I got to thinking about it. That is really kind of nice. I mean, and they weren't acting or play acting. This was something that they thought was a requirement of the society. 
I mean, it was, you know, this was back in 57. Uh, you know, a lot of them have changed now, see, because of influences. But I'm saying that type of thing. And then I contrasted that with walking in a lot of barber shops where black people were. <laughs> oh, you know, the minute you walk in and start getting those insults. Hey, man, by the time you show up for a haircut, all that mess you got on your head, see, that's somebody sitting over there reading the magazines. See, and then everybody laugh. See, the difference. A difference in feeling, a difference in, in perspective. You might say, well, that's a little thing and that's innocent. It's not. Because when you add several other hundred things to that, it winds up being hostility. That's the bottom line. When you add it all up in a long column and then draw a line under it, just like mathematics. All these little things that we do. Walk out of here tonight saying that you're not going to do two things as far as use of language. See, what's the greatest two-letter two-word phrase that black people have added to the language in the northwestern hemisphere of this planet in the last hundred years. Our contribution. See, we've got all these black books on here. See, you know, this is wonderful. But let's be honest. Contribution to language. See, step, Japanese step forward. What's your contribution to language in the last 100 years? Relatively recent time, not two trillion years, last 100, last 50. Japanese step forward, they'll say something. Chinese, white people, then ask black people, male person, north western hemisphere. Step forward, take the mic. Think of what you have contributed to language, the way that people communicate with each other. Uh, Five words, no, give me one. The most prominent one. You know what it's going to be. We got the real young people in here? I have to watch it, see. But it's going to be ML. We call everything that. That's what you call black culture. The contribution. This is our contribution. Step forward, see. In fact, we get on radio, get on a in the movies and ask for an assignment where we can go out and say it in 15 different ways and ask to be paid for it. And people do. $40 a shot, maybe, in some real fancy theaters and sit up there and applaud. There's somebody walking out on a stage showing you how to say MF in 30 different ways. And what are you really saying? Is this a real contribution? The sky is that. The bus station is that. Your buddy is that, standing next to you. When the bus comes, that's what the bus is. The bus driver is that. <laughs> Particularly if he's two minutes late. <laughs> and everybody on the bus is that. <laughs> the money you're trying to get out of your pocket, that's what it is. <laughs> it's a description for everything. You can't describe nothing without that. You're completely lost for language without it. Got to have it. Got to stick it in there somewhere. Is there any place I can put this? If some person came here from wherever, Lower Slobovia, and didn't speak anything and talked to black people, this is mostly what he or she would hear. And they would say, oh, very interesting. You mentioned this MF. Very much. Who is he? Must, must be your king. A very important fellow, maybe. Can't get through the day without talking. See? Now, I'm making it comical, but at the same time, I'm holding up that mirror. So you start with yourself if you're going to change the universe. See, we always talk about how, you know, our poor parents did this and whatnot. What are we doing? If they would suddenly show up and say, now, you know, if... Let's talk about language, see? we just drop our heads and start trying to hide. Uh-oh, we're in trouble, see? Now, these are things we do voluntarily, but it's all a result of white supremacy now, see? All right, but what am I saying about dues? I'm, this is not a put-down. I'm holding up the mirror to myself and everybody else because I'm a victim. I'm saying when you walk out of here tonight, just say you're going to practice not using it anymore. 
even at your age. And it'll slip out probably as soon as you get out of here. <laughs> but try to work on that. All right, another key word is a word that you apply to females, particularly black ones. She is not a bitch ever again from this night on. Ever. Ever. I'm talking about words, you see, because the chief weapon of a racist, a white supremacy, is a word. They use guns when they run out of words. See, when they can no longer talk to you and get the effect that they want. See, put certain ideas in your head and have you act in certain ways, then they come with the guns. See, so you use it in reverse. You use words. Certain words you use, certain words you don't use. See, and you stack them a certain way. See, it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't have to be Swahili. Word is, a word is nothing but a tool, like a pair of flyers. You pick up the pair of flyers and you do a certain job. You pick up a certain word and you do a certain job. So you don't call a female a bitch. You don't go around saying that you particularly like to sleep with dogs, but you will call somebody that you have been in bed with just that. Another thing is, that's talking about the speaking part. Another factor is the black female being hit. Every black female should leave here and say to every other black female that a part of the so-called black culture, which we're always talking about in settings like this, is going to be from now on that no black male for any reason other than direct self-defense, meaning she kind of lost her head or something or whatever and came running out of the kitchen <laughs> swinging her axe <laughs> while you sitting there eating your post toast. <laughs> See, now you have to take direct action to defend yourself. But I'm saying because she gave you some lip, sounding off, or uh, spent some money that she wasn't supposed to, or whatever, She's not supposed to be hit. See, I haven't earned the right to hit no black female. Haven't earned it. And when I get in position to earn it, then I'll have no reason to. See, so it doesn't work out any way that you shake it up and pour it. I'm not going to go around hitting the white supremacists. So why should I be busting her in the teeth? Talking about, I'm a man. See, we got these huge voices. See, the average black male got a deep voice like mine. Okay, a lot of us. And when we go to work on a female, one thing that we are proving is our what? Quote, manhood. And then after we get through knocking her all up and down the steps with all the little people, young people running around there saying, what's going on up there? See, and some of your own young ones running around saying, don't do that, daddy. Don't. Ah, yeah, yeah. It's going on right this minute. It's going on right this minute. And then what happens? Somebody calls. Now, you're hitting her to prove that you are a man. Then somebody calls the man. Okay? Really, it ain't but one. Now we're going to find out what a boy is. And so here he comes, tracking mud right across your living room floor that you just got through telling her about cleaning up. That's why you hit her in the mouth. See? Now, he comes in there walking, tracking mud. What's the trouble? What's the trouble with you, fella? See? Talking very calmly. And all of a sudden, you come down. We just have a little misunderstanding, officer. Mm-hmm. Why don't you hit him? And his buddy behind him. See? And kick them all out in the street and say, if you got any more down there like you, send them down here. See? Because I said I was a man, and I'm proving it. You think a man that goes around hitting women? You chumps going to find out what a man is tonight. Yeah. Can you see yourself doing that? And since you're not going to do that, think in advance. See, people who are what you call creative or forward-thinking, they think in advance. 
So I'm saying you leave here tonight. See, everything that I'm saying is not supposed to be just within a jestful fashion, even though I'm making it that way, because it's kind of hard sitting and listening to somebody just jawbone all the time. I'm saying leave here. The female is not a bitch, not ever. When you slip up and say it, make out a catalog. That makes the fourth time I've said it this week. Try to cut that down to one. See? And just remember, same way with ML. And don't hit the females. Now, the females can cooperate with this and kind of push it along by when everything is going fine, when you first meet this fella that you think you really like and you're going to start spending some time with him, and when you all are sitting somewhere with the candlelight and roses, if that's the setting, or wherever, in the apartment, in the car, and you're really talking about how much you really go for each other and all the rest of that stuff that you half believe, okay? The female should speak up and say, Johnny, I want to tell you something that's very, 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 very important to me. And we've been seeing each other about a month now. Don't ever hit me. Now, if you hit me, there's nothing I can do because you're much bigger than me, you're muscular, you play basketball and all like this. But don't ever hit me because what that will mean is that we can never be together again <laughs> for any reason if you ever hit me. Now, I might say some things that might make you mad, or I might do some things that might make you mad. Hopefully not. But whatever happens, I want you to say that you, and get it in your mind that you will never hit me because I can't stand for you to hit me. And it won't prove anything if you hit me. Now, some of the males sitting here will say, Oh, man, some women like to be hit. How about that? See, the code got to cover everything. <laughs> All right? Otherwise, it ain't code. What about a person, a black female, who likes to be hit? I mean, she's not satisfied until that at least two licks are hit, you know, come Saturday night. See, then everything kind of settles down after that. Been hit twice. That's about the quota for the night. And she's just that way. Now, you don't hit that person either because you're supposed to have some sense. Because first place, first thing you're supposed to determine is that person does not need to be hit. That person needs help. See, anybody that needs to be hit needs help. Anybody who's asking to be hit, you know. Well, heck, it looks as, this looks like Cecilia, you know, is always starting something where I hit her. I want to. So, you know, I'm going to take her, in, you know, somewhere to talk to somebody. Find out why this is. That's if you're concerned enough. But the bottom line is, you should leave here tonight. See, I'm trying to give, we're always talking about what do we do about a situation. We start with these basic things. That keeps those blinking lights out of the neighborhood and all that breaking glass up there on the second floor. See? Dishes flying out the window and all that stuff that you've got to pay for, by the way. See? Why break up the furniture? And then last but not least, out there, you know, man, take these cuffs. Hey, loosen these cuffs up. They're too tight. See, it's going on right this minute, all stretched out across the hood. Oh, settle down there, fella. Settle down now. See, the voice of authority, the voice of people who know what they're doing, the voice of people who run every facet of your business, including when you hit what you call your woman. See, and we're just not going to have no more of this. Me and Pete been up here twice in this apartment building tonight. We don't want to have to come up here again. Why can't you people behave? Now, that sounds awful, like talking to children, because that's who he's talking to. Not men. Let's face it. Now, I'm putting a lot of bite in here, but this is the way it is. It takes that. But I'm not talking down to anybody. I've been told, you know, don't talk down to people because I can't. I'm a victim, too. All victims are equal. See, I'm talking to you, but this is us because it goes on. Does this not go on? Haven't you seen some of it? Yeah. Haven't you done some of it? Okay. I'm saying just don't do no more. It's worthless. See? Now, what do you do? Compensatory law, using this word. Right up here. Making up for what's missing. 
What do you do in a situation like that when you don't know what to do? You minimize conflict by minimizing contact. Minimizing meaning you, you, know, you just break away. You say, well, look, we're having an argument. I can see where it's going to get worse. Clara, I'll see you. I'll call you tomorrow, okay? No, no, you're going to talk to me now. See? No. You come right on back. Now, now, Clara, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> and just start walking. See, somebody got to have some sense. This thing is getting out of hand, see? And just walk. I mean, it'll take care of itself. See? You might call up tomorrow, I mean, you know, and, you know, and right away you start getting all those obscenities over the phone, see? Just hang up the phone. Well, she ain't cool off yet. <laughs> Wait two more days. Right? See? Whatever. But then when you reconnect, you'll be on another wavelength. Minimize conflict by minimizing contact. Just remember that. This is how you do it. Two dudes on a street corner, no, no different. See? Walk away. Somebody's got to have some sense. Don't start showing out in front of your buddies. This ain't high school no more. And even though we might have some high school students here, grade school students, it's, it doesn't matter there either. You're not losing nothing. You say, hey, man, you going to let him talk to you like that? Talk to who? I'm gone. See? I wouldn't let him call let. I am a person on my own. I wasn't born with him. He ain't my Siamese twin. I'm not going to get involved in some program that he's starting out here on the corner. I got my own program. See, this is why, see, the people who have advanced just a little bit more than what we call the classic black person in the Northwestern Hemisphere, see, you can stand there and say something about the little so-called Japanese as he goes by with his little briefcase, see, he's going by there, okay, all right, now you, hey, where are you going there, you little slant-eyed so-and-so and so-and-so, I was fighting you gooks over there now, see, y'all ain't nothing, you know. I was in the fourth division, see, right, and all the rest of that. Now, is he going to stop and turn around like we do? You know, we've we got to turn around, see. Hey, man, I see anything to you, that's us. I mean, but that's trained behavior. We saw our uncles do that before us and our buddies, see. This is something that we feel that we have to do. You don't have to do that. It ain't nothing to that. I mean, E.T. looking down from the moon would tell you that. See, you know, what are you turning around for, responding to that? Hey, man, do I say anything to you? Huh? Do I say anything to you? Every time I come by here, you got something to say. I mean, now, if you think you bad, come on. See, that's us. And then look around and see who's looking, see, because, you know, we are theater. That's our theater. <laughs> see? But like I say, the other little non-white person, not a white person, you go by and insult him, say all kinds of things. And, you know, he might just look around and kind of frown a little bit, see, and he might not even do that, see, and just keep right on trucking and go right on up in that building on the elevator. Three days later, you're up there facing him asking for a job. And he's still being polite. And he knew you just came off street. He saw you. That's the guy that, you know, hey, he don't care. He's not paying any attention to that. See? I think we can take you on maybe in three days. We have a place for you down on the assembly line. We will be making, we, uh, have you, do you have any credentials? If you don't, we will try to help you. And uh, you have a nice day. Very good, see. Business-like. Got their mind full of business. But we are just constantly going around trying to figure out some way to be in conflict and put on a show. Greatest show-offs in the world. And nobody's looking. That counts. The people that count don't care, and the people that care don't count. This is why we, we break our necks even try to get things to show off. We show off to each other. And for what? I remember years ago, a black male came up to me. Watch the words I use. See, I say white men, black male. Because, see, I'm still a boy. See, you can't be a subject to white supremacy and be a man. It is impossible. Impossible. Now, you can argue with everything that I'm saying, but you cannot stand up and tell a white man that you are a man. Because he'll say, where are your credentials? 
Not under white supremacy. Where is your proof? Well, uh, I own this and I do this. No, you don't. Not if you're non-white. On this planet, you don't own anything. You move when I tell you to move. Or somebody like me tells you to move. You get promoted. So, oh, no, I, I work. I work, you know, everywhere I work, uh, I work down at the factory. And my foreman is, uh, he's black. What about his foreman? And what about the foreman behind him? No such thing as a black person being in charge of anything on this planet. Because that would be a contradiction to the existence of white supremacy. Name something that a black person is in charge of that when a white person comes around, some white person somewhere, and says, forget about it. Close it down or whatever. That you don't have to do it. I don't know of nothing. And that includes so-called countries. The racist walks in and say, who are you? Now, I'm the president of this place. It's a, it's, this is a new country, and I have my flag on the hill, and we are ready to do business in my own independent country. So, oh, is that right? So, yes, we have our own money. Oh, so, is that right? What's your money worth? Your money is worth what I say it's worth, boy. Now, you're going to find out what truth is this morning. See, I have ships in the harbor with bananas and manganese. What is that worth? It's worth what I say it's worth. Fellow, you don't know nothing. Where did you go to school? Same place I sent you. See, that's why you flock wherever I am to get your so-called education. Don't you know I know what you learn? I know everything that you know and no more because I teach you. Yes, but, yeah, I'm waiting. See, that's the way it goes. Now, it sounds like what I'm doing is belittling a lot of people when I make these kind of talks. On the white supremacists, then it does a so-called destructive effect on you because the one thing that they know about us is that we have problems facing the truth. Problems. This is why we keep going around in a big circle. And I'm saying, how do you come out of it without just keep digressing and whatnot? You, uh, simple things. The elevator insults, the little everyday things. This is how so-called culture evolves. See, we don't have a culture right now that you can call anything. We've got an MF culture and a boogaloo culture. And I'm going to get me some stuff tonight, culture. Either some cocaine or some sex. That is our culture in the Northwestern Hemisphere. Don't deny it. But we got to do something else other than that. Because that's not constructive. Just sitting around snorting on poison, that's not anything. That stuff is poison. Cocaine is poison. Stop calling it drugs. Call it poison. Go drink some Clorox. <laughs> you know, you want some cheap poison. There it is. You know, kitchen's full of it. Go in there and mix it all up. Ammonia, Clorox, it'll do something. You know, you'll get to make all kind of discoveries. Right. Might spook up on something that you can sell. Right. Now, you think I'm kidding. I mean, there are some people who will do this. Back in the old days, people who were really what you call alcoholics would mix up anything. Hair tonic, anything that sounds, that tastes remotely like whiskey when they didn't have the money to get it. There are some people in this room that knew people who did this. Shampoo, whatever. See? But let's just deal with just drugs right now. Just let's analyze it. I don't want anybody to give me anything that I need. I said give. I didn't say sell. I mean, that I'm going to have to have. And I gave this illustration. I've been doing it for the last two days. I just gave the illustration of ice cream. If a person came to me with a dish of ice cream and say, Fuller, here is a dish of ice cream that I make. I got plenty of ingredients back here in the back to make all you want. But now when you take about a dish of it, eat a whole dish, it's going to do something to your taste buds. 
and you are going to want it about every three hours for the rest of your life. But I will provide it for you, and you don't have to pay for it because i got plenty of it. But about every three hours, if you're on the bus or everywhere, you're going to have to jump off the bus and run back here and get it if you ain't got enough that you can carry with you because it'll be melted or whatever. Ice cream, that's what I'm talking about. Not nothing illegal. But it will do something to your taste buds you'll have to have. You won't be able to think. You won't be able to do nothing. You'll get mad at people if you can't get it. Now, if a person walked in here and told me this, my common sense would tell me, man, don't give me that stuff. I don't want nothing that I'm going to need every two or three hours. I don't want you to give it to me. Say, well, I'm going to give it to you. No, I don't want you to give me nothing. That I, I, got a, I, got, I need rent. <laughs> I need to get some sleep. I need. I do get hungry, so I need food. I might even go around on the street begging money to get food because I'm hungry. Man, I got enough needs. Please don't bring me no more needs. See? But this is what a person is doing when they give you or sell you some drugs. They are creating a need. And doggone, black people need everything already. <laughs> Plaster falling down on your head, you're talking about needs, you got them. You need somebody to come and do something about your needs that you got already. Not add to them. And it's nothing but pure logic. But the average person does not think logically. And among the young people, they say it's because of pure pressure. Forget that nonsense. There is nobody on this earth who is exactly like you, so you don't have no peer. I don't care if he's, you've got four of you and you're twins. You do not have a single peer because you are simply not that other person, even though you look exactly like them. There are some molecules in you that don't match theirs. Your fingerprints don't match. You are a different person. You're made that way. You're supposed to be. And you're supposed to have the greatest regard for that. Don't even go around trying to look like anybody else. That's a sickness, too. I mean, don't try to look like your sister. My sister sure is good looking. I wish I looked like my sister. No, don't look like me. No, no, no. Look like you. This is you. You are unique. You've got a purpose. Just hang around for a while, keep your mind clear, and it'll be laid out to you. See, you can't figure everything out. You know, when you don't come here in a crib figuring everything out, things come to you. And what your purpose is will present itself at some time. But you've got to give it space. Don't clog your mind up with a whole lot of nonsense. In the meantime, you try to learn everything that you're supposed to learn. How much time I got? How much time am I supposed to be talking? <laughs> okay, I don't want to see. It's not supposed to be a captive audience, see. But at the same time, I want to get some questions and answers and things. But I'm gonna run through a few things. Black people are supposed to be doing four things at all times. I call it the use of time and energy. Now, if you don't remember anything else tonight, try to remember these four things. That way, you don't ever get lost. That's what codification is all about. That's what having a code is all about. Just four things you're supposed to be doing at all times non-white people, victims of racism. First, producing, repairing, cleaning, etc., something of constructive value at all times. That's number one. Now, you're supposed to be doing one or the other. See, if you're not doing one, you're doing the other. That's number one. Produce, producing, repairing, cleaning, etc., something of constructive value, constructive value. See, not producing no drugs, a bathtub of alcohol, or making a homemade knife so you can kill somebody. Producing something of constructive value. Okay, number two, exchanging views about ways and means of eliminating racism and or producing a product called justice. Either or, if you're doing one, you're doing the other. If you happen to eliminate racism, saying something or doing something, you happen to produce a thing called justice. That's automatic. If you're trying to produce justice, you also are helping to eliminate racism. Because you can't have justice and racism in the same ballpark. 
Now, that's exchange and views about doing this. Reading, writing, exchange and views. Any kind of communication about eliminating racism or producing justice. That's number two. Number three, eating and sleeping correctly and only as necessary. See, black people got a thing about, you know, we got to eat all the time. We go anywhere around some food. We can't have a hard lab of meat and see without having a whole lot of food. They go feed. You know, you just ate. See? I ain't going over there if they ain't going to feed. See? That's an old tradition that at one time served a purpose. See, we have to turn loose to some traditions. And that's one of them. That's eating every time food is available. But that came from an old tradition that's not too distant. It came from the time when a few people old enough in here to remember, in order to go see Aunt Hagee, you had to go 20 miles by a bad road in a wagon. So by the time Uncle Jess hitched up the team, talking about something like the 1930s and mid-1940s now, before what they call World War II, hitch up that team, and then everybody get on the wagon, and you go down that bad road. No highway, no freeways. See, that's something relatively recent. And I mean, sometimes traveling way up into the night. Can't hardly see. Mules acting up. See, so by the time you got where you were going, you were good and hungry, dusty, tired. All the little ones are irritable. See, been bouncing in the wagon, couldn't get no sleep. See, so everybody was good and hungry. So they had, usually had little small houses out there. Nobody could crowd in them. So if it's summertime, you set up tables on the outside. Bucket of lemonade, a whole lot of fried chicken, cabbage, watermelon, the works. So you just stagger off the wagon. Woo! You then grab that lemonade bucket if it's hot, see, you know. Dip down in there, start pouring everybody, you know. Everybody gather around now. It's plenty for everybody. See, that's the way it was. It was a nice aspect to it. But now most of those places are gone. We don't do that anymore. Go by jet plane and all like that. But we carry on the tradition that if we visit somebody, they got to feed us. No, we can stop that. Just stop all that cooking. See, no, I didn't cook. When they show up thinking they eat. No, I know that's what we used to do, but no, I did not cook. You didn't cook. What am I over here for? Right. Over here to exchange views <laughs> about eliminating racism. Want to empty your stomach? <laughs> yeah. Well, you should have ate before you came. See? Right. Yeah, see, because food is not that difficult. It used to be you had to prepare that food from scratch. There was no such thing as no supermarket. See, some people, you know... Of course, you got to be kind of have, you know, gray hair to remember that. There was once a time when you're going to make potatoes, you had to start from scratch. You get to get the knife out and start peeling. See, ain't no shaking, baking, all that stuff. See? But see, those days are kind of gone by the wayside. And there's some nostalgia connected with that because people related to each other a little better. But I'm saying it's different now. So eat and sleep, still on number three. Only when necessary, not as a habit. So you're not trying to carry on an old tradition, black people and fried chicken, just because you've got a big pile of it. See, I'm going to try to see if I can find the bottom of that pile. See? No. And then we get sick. And then we go into the hospital. And the doctors say, you're going to have to lose some weight. See? And you're going to have to cut down on your cholesterol. And the statistics show that it might be something to that. Because we are big heart attack victims. So now what do I mean by correct food? Try to find out what is the best food. Now I can't really talk about that because a lot of the food is poisonous. There's a lot of poison in every kind of food that is put out, particularly in this day and time. So you have to kind of pick and choose. You've got to kind of feel our way on faith on that one. But you can minimize your food intake if you can. Now... Number four, sexual intercourse, no more than twice a week. Now, what was the topic of this at the top? The uses of time and energy. See, I'm not talking about moralizing. I'm not doing no preaching. 
Because I know the average black male say twice a week. <laughs> Man, four times a night, and I'm just warming up. You ain't talking to me. You know, you talking about you 60 years ago. <laughs> but, uh... The black male, that's an old tradition in the Northwestern Hemisphere, got a long list of addresses in his pocket. Ladies, you know that. I know it. See, maybe not so much now on account of AIDS, etc., but a lot of us don't care about that either. We breeze right past that, too, till we catch it. Okay? But traditionally, the black male, see, now we got Helen and Sue and Georgiana and Phyllis and I don't know that other one's name. See, that's the black male. See, and we make a round robin circuit all over the city. Well, let's see. I ain't talked to, I ain't talked to Willie Jean in about two months now. Wonder what I, I better call her. Up. See, here it is Saturday evening, and you ain't got nothing to do. Okay, I think I'll go by and tap her up lightly. <laughs> on my way to see Jeanette. That's your black male. Isn't this us? Yes, yeah, it's us. See? Okay. That's the way we put it when we're talking about it, even to ourselves. See? I ain't seen her in a little while. See? So you go by there and get in her way for a while, and she's trying to wash dishes, and you feeling and going on. So the next thing you know, you're back here in the bedroom. All right, all well and good. Now he comes out. See, he runs around and goes by one of his buddies' house and spends a little time, but it's still early, and he's still got a lot of energy. Some of us have, you know, if you're young enough, virile enough, fitting the stereotype, okay? So you look at your watch and say, doggone, it's just 9 o'clock? You know, I, would, I, I would like to go by and see Earl, but I don't know where he is tonight. I think he's out with his girlfriend. I ain't got much nothing to do. Ain't no point in going back over there where I just left. So she's busy doing her work now, and I don't want to go back over there no way. So, so she put me to work. See, so I wonder is Linda at home? Yeah, Linda. Linda just moved in the neighborhood, and she got a new friend, too. I ain't met her. I think I'll go by there. Because she told me to drop by any time. See? So now we are, you know, the adrenaline is flowing again. So there we go. We got a long list. That's your black male. That's the old tradition. It ain't new. It's been passed down from generation to generation. That's how it's done. See? And the females pretend that it ain't so, but it is. See, because they got brothers. And they hear them in there talking on the phone. See? But they, now, the black female is so starved for manhood that she puts up with this nonsense, okay? Even when her better judgment is telling her not to, okay? Now, here's the black female in there doing some writing on Friday night. She's got a brother who's in there on the phone. Her brother is talking to his girlfriend across town. And here's the black female listening to her brother talk to his girlfriend, and she drops the pencil and shakes her head and say, Ralph talks more nonsense than anybody I've ever seen in the world. And any woman who's on the other end of that line listening to that foolishness, I don't want for no sister-in-law, ever. If he's been in there for an hour tying up the phone and knowing that I got to use it, talking that foolishness, then there's a knock on the door, and she drops that pencil and goes out with somebody who's just like Ralph. Of course, it ain't that too much difference between black males, because the races have structured that, have structured everything that way. Most black males talk the same old jive, the same old way, go through the same old scenario, got the same list of girlfriends in their pocket, phone numbers, all in little scraps of paper in the wallet, see? You know, I wonder, see, one, it didn't put a name on it. Doggone, I showed you this one. <laughs> Got this one at the football game, in the middle of a play, see. Damn. I sure hope it come to me, you know, who this is. I wonder, was it this one or that one? 
the one on the right or the left? I don't know. You know. I wanted to talk to the one on the left. Both of them give me the phone. Well, I don't know. I put it back in there. That's your blackmail. These grandiose plans. Now, number four of the time energy. See, I'm talking about, I'm not moralizing, I'm talking about uses of time and energy. And this is self-discipline. If you limit yourself to two acts of sexual intercourse a week, talking to the black males mostly, you're going to have to make that list short. Now, somebody initially is going to come up missing out. But that's fine. That's healthy. Because, see, you've been lying all the time anyway. See, so what you do, little by little, you just by the act of selectivity will pick the one that you care the most for, which is the way it's supposed to be. Or the two. See, you might not, you know, you might have a list of about nine people long. So you might drop everybody but three. But at least that's getting it into a bracket. And then little by little, if you keep it down to twice weekly, so you'll have two dropouts somewhere. <laughs> so they're going to get tired. Yeah, yeah really, I'm serious. They're going to get tired of being put on hold. Okay? So you but you haven't been, you, I believe you got somebody, no, baby, you me? See? Yeah, I mean, no, you have not been, you know, you you changed something. That's, I don't know. I, I'm not going to get into the details of it, but it's a new fella coming to town, and I think I'm going to start dating him. Well, okay, so you say so be it, because that was part of your plan anyway. All right, but it worked out well for everybody. So you wind up with maybe one or two females. See, I'm not trying to hurt nobody. I'm just getting this thing down to a t use of time and energy. Now, you got all this extra time now. What do you do with it? Go right back up that chart. Because you're supposed to be using your time and energy doing one of four things at all times. If you're not asleep, you're not having sexual intercourse, you're not eating, you're supposed to be somewhere exchanging views about ways and means of producing justice or eliminating racism. And if you're not doing that, you're supposed to be doing some kind of constructive work. Now, this applies to females as well as males. I just kind of emphasize the males because when it comes to the sex thing, see, the other ones have to have this great proliferation because, see, that, that's that stud complex see, that's been bred into us, as Jimmy the Greek talked about. <laughs> when he, you know, with his big woman, you know, and you breed the big, you know, like, oh, Oh, these people are so big and strong. <laughs> Woo! That's why you get these athletes. Fearsome. Oh. Yeah, okay. But that's what, you know, I'm trying to say. Now, do's and don'ts. But remember those four, and you don't ever get lost. See, if you're doing something, say, now, am I... If, if is what I'm doing on that list of the uses of time and energy. Just four. And if it's not, it means you're in dangerous territory. You're not contributing to what you call the struggle. I hate that word, too. Black people saying we're struggling. See, No, you don't need to struggle. All you need to do is do what needs to be done. Forget about the struggle. It's just one, two, three. See, Do what needs to be done. It's all mathematical. If you figure it correctly, it becomes a struggle if you don't have no plan. All right? And codification, what I call the compensatory code, the black code, if you want to use that quick term, doesn't work for the racists. Now, somebody brought it up this evening and say, what? The white supremacists have your book, Fuller. They know what's in it. How do you deal with that? A counter-racist code does not work for a racist. Otherwise, it's not counter-racist. I don't care how he picks it up and shakes it up and pours it and bounces it around. It won't work for him or her. It will not work for racist man and racist woman. We'll try to move on now. Uh, trinkets. Gold necklaces. I don't need a gold necklace or an iron one neither. <laughs> took me several hundred years, they tell me, to get the chain off my neck that they put around there. That was made of iron. So you don't need to be out here killing each other. It's okay to have one. 
But I'm saying, all this snatching necklaces off each other's neck and running down the street, robbing each other of necklaces. You've got a necklace on, I mean, you got to be fearsome about it. I mean, it might be best for us to just take them off, leave them in the dresser for a while, until we learn some sense, see. Because the necklaces are made out of gold. The gold is produced by a whole lot of hard-working black people in some mines in a place that we always say is our motherland, okay? And they're working for the white supremacists. They get the gold out of the ground, make it into a necklace, and then they take it from, okay, you come over here, fella, give me the necklace that you got out of the ground from all this hard work at low wages that I'm paying you, and I will take it over across the water and put it around the neck of a black person. See? Symbolic chain. Used to be an iron chain, now it's a gold one. But it's going to have the same effect because it's going to get him killed. See? Iron chain used to kill him. Now the gold chain is going to kill him. And who's going to kill him is some other person that looks exactly like him is going to come down the street and spot it and shoot him between the eyes and snatch it and run because that's the value system that I have put into their minds. Just stop and think about it. See, so stop worshiping trinkets. That's what they got the red people on. Come here, chief. Take a little sip of this. Now sit down here. Make yourself comfortable. Let me see if I can find me a quill somewhere. Now, okay, so the chief gets a little high on that rum. See? And then he gives the chief the quill and some papyrus, paper or whatever, and a piece of red cloth, maybe. And says, you see that over there? Sign here. I'll take Manhattan, the Bronx, and Staten, Island, two. Period. Fine. That's how it's done. And the chief say, okay. Then later on he says, didn't you sign this? Now that's, I'm just going by what I've been told. There was some kind of scenario like that went down. That's how they do the same thing with drugs. A lot of white people, of black people say, well, it's, it's not a racist conspiracy, and white people will certainly say it. It's not a racist conspiracy, this drug thing, because white people are on it, too. Drug dealers will tell you, white people, I've got a lot of white customers, but it doesn't affect black people the same as it affects white people. If you don't believe it, look at all this killing. And black people are already in terrible shape. See, the racists play the percentages, the white supremacists, just like in any war. You figure so many casualties of your own troops when you go into a battle. You put a big chart up on the wall and say, now when we make this landing, we're going to send in the paratroopers first. And our calculations according to our intelligence is we're going to have at least 20% casualties. But by 0800 hours, we will have captured our objectives, every last one of them, with 20% casualties. And we have already written off 20% of our personnel. Now, General, do you have anything else to say? All right, thank you very much, gentlemen. Let's go. Business people. Business people. That's the way they do it. And they do the same thing with the drugs. They did the same thing with the chief. The settler sat there and took a snort of the rum, too. But the chief wound up signing the paper and lost the land. See, they bait you in. It's not a new trick. It's an old trick. In order to convince you if I'm a con artist, see, the chief weapon of a racist is deceit. But in order to deceive you, I have to do a little bit of what I'm trying to get you to do. Anybody that deals in money in the card shark game and all like that knows that. What they call the pigeon drop, the bunco drop. You know, a male and a female working together maybe. And they find a wallet. See, they put up a little money up front. They show you something first. See, otherwise you ain't going to fall for it. They say, look, we found $2,000. Now, but to show your confidence now, Grandma, 
you go and draw some money out of the bank, I mean, you know, and we'll give you part of what we got here. And she winds up with an envelope full of paper. But it was money first. And they showed her real money. That's the come on. Everybody that, you know, that some people here involved in law enforcement or something like that might know. They call it the bunco. And it still works right today. They usually clean out old people with it. They usually well-dressed, well-mannered people run the bunco squad uh, game. Sometimes called the pigeon drop. Now, they do the victims of racism the same way with the drug thing. Now, how did they do it? In the late 1970s, cocaine was considered the gentleman's Hollywood. See? New York, Madison Avenue, all this. Marseille, Paris. See, this is what the elite use. Those bums down there in the alley, they snort, you know, they use heroin. See, because they ain't got no sense. See? That was the propaganda that was put out. So black people always want to be sophisticated. So we are easy marks for almost anything that comes down the pipe. They say, well, yeah, they, you know, if I use heroin, I guess I'm a bum. Because sophisticated white folks with a whole lot of money and a whole lot of sense and a whole lot of power, they use cocaine. But cocaine, see, at that time was $300, $400. It was considered a very expensive drug. See, so once they put the idea out among black people, because black people always want the Cadillac and the Mercedes, the BMW, whatever's the most sophisticated thing out there, that's what we want, because we want people to respect us. See, so cocaine became the number one thing in our minds through the propaganda hype. Now the smart guys in the laboratories went to work. Say, now, we got their minds? They're thinking cocaine now? Okay, let's come up with a cheap version and shoot it out there right quick and it'll be potent and something that they'll have to have all the time, see, so we can keep it rolling. We don't want nothing that's going to last too long, so it was crack. Now I understand it's ice. Next month, next year, five years from now, it'll be something else because they're on a roll. They got warehouses full of stuff you ain't never heard of before, see. You'll have to have it all the time, see, every second. If it gets that way, if they want to control you in that manner. See, they release this stuff as they see fit. Why? Because you've got an ocean of young black people walking the streets after the 1960s, after the riots. See, who are strong and relatively intelligent and ain't no old black people from the back of the bus because they never had to sit on the back of the bus. And a lot of them have a little so-called education, can read and write would be asking for jobs. And people, young hordes of black people, by the thousands and maybe millions, walking up and down city streets looking for jobs are dangerous. Who walk, you know, filling up employment offices like they were doing just a few years ago before the crack cocaine phenomenon. See? Say, man, you know, we're not asking for no handouts. We're asking for jobs. I want to do a decent day's work for a decent day's pay. And I want a full day's pay. No more of that, you know, back of the bus, down on the farm type pay. And I'm qualified to do something else so I can learn to do something else. See, where are the programs and whatnot for me to learn to do something else? People like that are dangerous. The racists knew it. So they say, how do we cut it off and keep them on hold for a while? Give them a poison. And having them cut down their numbers by killing each other about the poison. That'll be our first move until we can figure out our second one. See, the black females, they'll be just running around having babies and totally confused. See, the rest of them, we'll throw in some AIDS, all right, because they like a lot of sex, so we'll throw that in there, too. And I want to talk about that, even though I know I'm in Northern California. <laughs> Somebody told me don't touch that subject, but I got to walk right into it. <laughs> Sir? <laughs> okay. <laughs> According to the code... And I'm going to try to use logic. And this is the illustration I've often given. Well, I gave it this evening anyway, earlier. We say there's so little love in the world. That's one of the explanations. That anywhere that you can get somebody, somewhere, to pay you some attention, 
by giving you some love, offering you some love. doesn't make any difference what the sex of the person is. We need love. People need love. There's not enough love, a whole lot of hate, a whole lot of uncaring, no affection. We need love. This is the argument that you get, and I'll agree with that. There's nothing incorrect about one male loving another male if it's love. So you say, I, you know, I, I love my brother. I, I love, I love my buddy. You know, we win Nam together. You know, I, 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 man, I love him better than a brother. You know, I, in fact, in a way of speaking, man, I mean, as far as understanding is concerned, I love him more than I love my wife because you don't understand me. See, a person might say that. Nothing incorrect about that. But let's put it within context. You know, go ahead. Love all you want to. But differentiate that from something else. Now, I'll give you this illustration. Let's say that I am very much in love with Roger. Now, Roger is my dog. Let's be logical. I mean, I love that dog. Like Bojangles love that dog that died. See? That he was grieving about in the jail that Sammy Davis sings about. But that does not automatically follow that you do certain things with that dog. Now, here I am. I mean, I'm walking the dog and whatnot. This is Roger. Everywhere I go, I go with Roger, and Roger goes with me. And if I can't go in that place because they say no dogs allowed, I ain't going in. Because I don't go no place without Roger, and Roger don't go no place without me. Because this is my dog, and I love my dog. <laughs> but now, when I cross that line, and I'm sitting up there reading, and Roger gets up in the bed, and I say, Roger, what's wrong? What's the matter? Look like you're bothered about something. You're not getting enough love? Don't I love you enough, Roger? And Roger whimples or something. That is not a cue. <laughs> okay, Roger. <laughs> Look like it ain't nobody in the world that cares about us. Let's get it home. <laughs> I mean, stop and think about the logic of that. But a male who wants to go up in the rear end of another male is the same principle. Come on now, See, you can love all you want to. There is, there is no equipment. There is no equipment on your buddy, John, that calls for that kind of activity. I mean, now you can stand up for him, fight for him, try to get him that job. See, speak up for him when nobody else will. Die for him. This is your buddy. I mean, you love your buddy. But you ain't got no business doing what to your buddy. That ain't what you do to your buddy, that F word. You don't, your buddy. Really? No, no. Stay out and behind your buddy's rear end. All right? And he stay out and behind yours. That's, that's correct. Keep that buddy that's clean. Okay? Same way with females. Stop that talking about, I know it's terrible the way it is. Black males in jail, rest of them out here snorting coke shooting co heroin, rest of them dropping out of school, no jobs, can't help you do nothing but make babies, see? So here comes Elvira. <laughs> Not putting anybody down, I'm just laying it out like it is, I hope. And because of Elvira's metabolism and her certain, you know, and certain things that may have happened to her when she was very young that she doesn't even remember, see? She might say, well, honey, you know, I had some bad experiences with males. You know, uh, this man, you know, I had to have an abortion, and I went to a doctor that didn't know what he was doing, and it was just a whole bunch of things. See, it might be a lot of things that have happened to a person. See, sometimes it's in the genetic makeup. Sometimes it's something that has happened to the person. It might be a number of reasons. But she will step in and say, you don't need no man, and you come on with me. i got plenty of room. And you move in with me. 
And then they lay back there licking and laughing on each other. <laughs> really? This is what it's this is what it is. See? And saying, Well, this is the best we can do. It ain't what neither one of us wants, but this is the way it is. <laughs> Resist the temptation. Because you're only this is what the racists want us to do. This is a part of their plan. They are the ones who came around saying that it was all right. See, they sent in a cadre of people. See? Talking about under the guise of love, and they gave it a word, gay. Gay. <laughs> gay. Really, it's another three-letter word. It's sad. The opposite of gay. But they gave it a cute word. See? It's not sex. Sex is male and female. You can't make nothing else out of it. Male and female is sex. Anything else is anti-sex. And it is also something else, insanity. Just like me and Roger with the dog. <laughs> really. You know, I can say, well, look, I'm a normal person. I go to work every day. I wear a suit and a tie. You know, I'm a minority. I mean, when it comes to sex and, you know, and you all are oppressing me on account of my sexual preferences here with Roger, <laughs> and nobody can deny that Roger loves me, and I love Roger, and give me a preacher to see if we can get married. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, if you think along those lines, you can go along those lines. I mean, and you can show the logic in it. But really, there's no logic in it according to the basic laws of the way things are, like the little boy said, it's supposed to be when he comes in and catches you doing these things. That ain't the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> He's correct. No, no matter how you're trying to hike it, and no matter how the racists stand behind you and say, that's all right, that's excellent for black people. You participate in it. In fact, it's a part of, it's a outgrowth of the black movement. This is what they'll tell you. <laughs> See? Oh, yes, we are a minority, too. That's, what, that's the white race, that's the white supremacists talking. See? Oh, I mean, you know, there isn't enough love in the world. Well, what is this fellow saying? See, he's only making an, more animosity. And not only that, he's making fun of people. This is what they'll tell you. Not really doing that. I'm just holding up a mirror, just like I'm doing with other things. And we should look at it like that. And don't advocate it and don't ignore it. And say that it is a sickness. Just like being on drugs is a sickness. It is. This is why people look for, you know, some help, some help. After a while, see, it's a sickness. And it's a form of insanity. See, if I start looking around on some mail, looking for some place to put my sex organs, I am losing my mind. <laughs> See, that's what is happening there. Now, I might be losing my mind only when it comes to that. But see, every, if you've ever been in an asylum, sometimes you talk to very intelligent people. But every now and then, they just kind of go off. <laughs> you know, and just go around slapping people. And, well. and they'll do that maybe for five minutes. And then it's over for the day. They're right back. Now, really, but I'm not, I'm not making jest of this. I mean, we're laughing because, you know, insanity is nothing to laugh at. You know, uh, you can tell probably from the way that I'm talking that I know a lot of people who are crazy because a lot of people say that I am. And I don't deny that. There's such a thing as justifiable insanity, but I'm not insane that way. See, like I'm talking about this anti-sex thing. But every black person is justifiably insane. See, they say, yes, sir. To, for the questions and answers? Oh, okay. Okay. The, uh, Mr. Richardson wants to say a few words. I wish I had uh, thought a little more before I introduced the folk. <laughs> but he came to our attention through one of his pupils. <coughs> Dr. Welsey, and that's how we first heard about him, and her enthusiasm rubbed off on us, got me to read this book, and one reason I'm interrupting you this time is I want everybody to have a chance to purchase one of these books, because if you can disagree with the program he's laid out, there's something wrong with you, 
And you ought to have the book. Oh, no, you said don't do that. Okay. Hmm? <laughs> you said don't do that. Don't you do what? The book, can <laughs> Can't do what? I was thinking if they didn't read the book, we should hit them with it. No, I, no. I won't say that. No. <laughs> so. <laughs> and any, anything that you want to do where the book is concerned should be strictly voluntary, see? Because the book is expensive. It costs me a lot of money to get it out because it's a, you know, it's, it's a, you might say a do-it-yourself project. See, in fact, I have to mail them out myself. See, I can't pay anybody to do it, and I just don't have the resources. And when I was told what I would have to charge after it was printed to get it out here, I didn't really want to go through with it. Dr. Wilson helped me to get the book out, but... They put an original cost of $30 on that book. And I said, I wouldn't buy that book myself for $30. And I meant that. And I told her that. And she says, well, you're out of touch. Well, of course, that's what books, some of them, run these days. Well, my, my See, now, I came up in the 1940s. I, you well know, I don't spent. buy them books, huh? Mine was well spent. I certainly okay. appreciate it. Well, and uh, okay. if you can take some questions now. Okay. Uh, should we have some questions? And I'll try to infuse some other information as we go along with the questions. But we don't want to have a captive audience here. That's against the code. Yes, ma'am. AIDS. Yes, what I'm saying is a racist conspiracy right along with the chemical. See, I call it chemical germ war making. And I'm saying any white person involved in any of that deliberately, particularly the drugs, is guilty of a racist war crime. And that every black person should leave here getting down to the doing part now. And I asked even white people the day before yesterday who were in the audience to go out of there. Some white person asked, what can we do? See, so the code's supposed to cover everything. So I say, if what you do is go out and tell other white people, legislators, that you want white people who are laundering money for the drug trade worldwide, every white person involved, and you couldn't have a drug trade without white people involved. First thing you do is label every white person involved in drugs and in the spreading of AIDS as a racist war criminal, since you say you've got a war on drugs and a war on AIDS. So you label that as a racist war crime, that any white person involved in this is automatically a racist. Any white person that doesn't want to be a racist just withdraw their help from that operation. Say, look, you know, captain of the ship, I would, I would deliver these drugs to the port of New York. But that would make me a racist war criminal. So I am not going to let you put this stuff on my ship. Now, so, you know, in other words, black people don't have all this stuff, fancy equipment, planes and whatnot, to lug drugs around enough to hit these streets. So that's where you go after it. You go after it at the top level, particularly the people in the money laundering business, the bankers. See, the real nice guy with the suit and the tie who does not snort cocaine, doesn't come anywhere close to anybody who does, doesn't speak English maybe, probably speaks French, or, or the language that they speak in Belgium or whatever, and here he has a nice little chateau, wife and two kids. Somebody comes and says, you launder this money for me, and you will make $200,000 almost instantly. Run it through your computers and whatnot, and we'll be doing business. That's what Hitler was doing, see, in World War II. So you got a parallel. In other words, you got a base to, from which to work, a legal base. First of all, you say it's racist, because that's what they executed these people about. Hermann Gore and all these people went on trial in the 1940s for war crimes, heinous crimes, getting rid of people by the use of poison. Now, that's what the racists are doing. And disease, okay? Then once you convict them, automatic execution. And I'm asking the white people to, to say, to ask their legislators to say, that's what we want. See, with a machine gun and say, you're cleaning up the, uh, the drug problem. See, you are running a game on us. 
That's somebody's son that you have roped in. See? What do you think this is? We can see through that. See, stop it where it started. We didn't know what the stuff was till you put it in my hand. Still don't know what it is. We just know what it does. See? So, you execute these persons. You call for their execution. And I'm talking about something like 50,000 corpses just to get warmed up. So you've got to make an impression because they're on a roll now. See? Yeah, just run them right through. See? Yeah. And then say, next. See? See, now, you, you think it won't stop. Now, a lot of people say it won't work. They say prohibition didn't work. It wasn't in the death penalty connected with prohibition. But you want the death penalty to be, to be scientifically placed. Because it's one thing about a nice, button-down collar, 35-year-old white fellow who's laundering money. He's not like a 16-year-old who's fascinated with a 9mm running around there in the alley. And he got more money, you know, $900, more money he ever had in his life, see, in a few minutes. See, this is a rational thinker. And when a couple of people walk into his office and say, you're now under arrest, sir, international police, and uh, you're charged with the racist war crime of distributing drugs to black people, you spell it right out, in the northwestern hemisphere of this planet, as of April, so and so and so and so, blah, 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 and you will be tried, and if convicted, you will be summarily executed in such and such a courtyard on such and such a day, and just read it off just like that, and just start rolling. I mean, get them all rolling. Just start picking them up and putting them in vans and have the bodies stacked up, and, you know, and you think that won't break the back of it? I mean, that will stop me from being in the business. <laughs> See, when I get the word, I just I just laundered some money, maybe. See, and I get the word that they made this new law, and that they are out there actually going through with it. See, when the guy comes around at noon the next day and say, you know, I got some more, I say, wait a minute, don't stop here. And who's who's behind you? You know, get out of here. See, you know, don't come in here no more, buddy. Have you heard the word? You know, don't come in here no more. Wait till things cool off or something. That's the way it will work. Do you get what I'm saying? Right. But first of all, blame all of this in some. The drugs and the AIDS on the white supremacists. Don't put it no place else. Leave here with that in mind. That's where the blame is going to be. Anytime somebody asks you, you get on television, get a shot on the radio and whatnot, it's just the white supremacists. It's the white supremacists who are doing it. Use just those terms. Don't say United States. Don't say Bolivia. Don't say Colombia. Don't say the drug cartel. Certainly don't say Noriega. See, you, you should be able to see all through that. See, say the white supremacists. This will be more effective than anything else you can do. Me and Dr. Wilson do a lot of it, see, and that's why they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear her talking, see. see? Anybody else can talk, but they don't want to hear it because she's going to say the drugs is a white supremacist conspiracy. Forget all that other jab. See, that's the way she's going to put it. Let me get, I'll be right with you. In a minute. Just Neil, of course. Right. I'm not a doctor. I haven't feared nobody. <laughs> yes, sir. Go ahead. Um, how can a white person live in a white supremacist uh, uh, country like America and South Africa avoid being racist? A white person can avoid being a racist by simply deciding. See, if the white people don't, racists don't live in countries. See, let's get that clear. Don't associate racism with South Africa, America, or any other place. See, get that in your head. It's kind of tricky. But see, don't ever associate racism with Americanism or with any other kind of ism. Just say white supremacy is racism. Fix this. And racism is white supremacy. Now, the question is, how can a white person anywhere avoid being a racist? simply by deciding that they ain't playing no more. They ain't going to practice it. That when they see a black person, they are going to help a black person on the basis of two things. It's two things I said this to an uh, audience that had white people in it a couple of days ago, because somebody raised that question, a white person. I said, two things to remember. Guarantee that no person that you encounter on this planet is mistreated. That's number one. Just two things. Number two. Guarantee that the person who needs help the most gets the most help. That's all you got to remember. If you walk up on an accident in the street, 
One person is walking around with a cut on the arm, bleeding. Another person is in a burning vehicle with both legs broken. Who needs the most help? The one in the burning vehicle. Now, both of them need help, but you pick out the person that needs help the most and go to that person first. Now, in almost any situation, that automatically means black people. And there's a word for that that's called justice. Not a new word. So that's how a white person can avoid being a racist. Now, once they go in that direction, saying, I'm going to dedicate my entire existence on this planet to helping the people who need help the most and guarantee that ain't nobody mistreated, that's a hard, tight rope to walk. But see, being a victim of racism is harder than that. So any white person that doesn't want to do it just becomes a racist suspect. So you never call a white person a racist. You just say what constitutes suspicion of them being one. <laughs> no, don't be accused. See, because you can't prove that they are racist. Because in a racist system, and you are a victim, how are you going to prove that a racist is a racist? If you watch, it's a scientific way of getting a racist to reveal who they are. Dr. Wilson did it on the Donahue show. I knew she was going to do it. Because, see, counter-racism is a science. Racism is a science. It's an exact science, just like playing checkers, just like any other science. It's a social science, but it's exact. It has precise laws like physics. And counter-racism, what we're trying to construct here, is the same thing. So what did Dr. Wilson do on the Donahue presentation? She didn't call anybody a racist. She described what a racist was. And a white lady in the audience stood up and said, you know, from what she's saying, I'm a racist. <laughs> you, you saw it, didn't you? See, much more effective than calling somebody a racist. Will the real racist stand up? <laughs> See, and then you orchestrate your words in such a way that the real racist can't sit still. <laughs> and so they have to stand up. <laughs> and reveal to the court of the world that that's who they are. Now, I don't know whether she knows it or not, but now she's in a trick bag. I mean, you know, she has confessed to a major crime of this planet, which means that, suppose, let's give, just for the sake of scenario, that same lady walked off that TV set and walked into an office where she works with me, and she is trying to get a job that I'm after. I already got her. See, when I walk into the EO office. I said, didn't you see this lady? She was on television two days ago. She said she was a racist. You want to hire a racist for this position and admit it, felon? That's what we're talking here. We're talking heavy timber. This is a major crime all over the world. She has admitted to it. Now, I don't know whether she knew what she was doing, but this is the science of doing it. Do you see what I'm trying to say? See, codification is supposed to be practical. See, we have gotten all the background material on these walls here, and we need it. We need all this background material. Read all these books, see? You know, digest as much as you can. Then you go forward with a set of codes about what to do about every situation that comes up on a job, any place. And this is how it's done. Now, what happened, just following that scenario, what happened in that same setting? A black female stood up and said, I resent you saying that you are racist. See how black people are? See, we are so afraid of this thing called racism that we want white people, even when they are practicing racism, to, de to deny that they are doing it. So we'll feel good. See? No. It's, it's, see, it's no, but go, go with it. That's the way to go. And keep going with it. See? And... I hope I answered your question. Now, i got to get to this young lady here. You started to ask a question? Well, I was saying, is there more black people in South Africa than there is white people? How come um, the black people in South Africa are treated differently? If there are more black people in South Africa than there are white people, why is it that the black people are still subject to the white supremacists? Is that what you're saying? Are still under them? still doing their bidding. It's because black people don't have anything. Traditionally, this is how we got in that trap in the first place. Remember Kunta Kinte and Roots? 
Okay, if the story is true, and we got reason to believe it is, Mr. Alex Daly told it, he researched it, Country Kente went down on the beach and he saw some strange people moving around down there. You know, white people, see? But he didn't know who they are, just some strange-looking people. <laughs> so he came back and told the person who had taught him to be a warrior. Say, what about these people down here? And the answer was something, oh, well, you know, well, we've seen something like them before, and they move around down there, and, you know, well, so what? Let them. See? Now, the whole purpose for studying all this history in here is to pick out your mistakes. Mm -hmm. That was a mistake. Mm -hmm. That was a mistake. If you remember, later on in that series, Country Kente was in the hole of that ship, and the man had taught him how to be a big, strong warrior, That's right. beat him all up in the process, was in the hole of the ship, too. So you got to have some kind of strategy. You just can't be out there flexing your muscles like we do in the penitentiaries and whatnot, out there lifting barbells behind bars. Behind bars, lifting barbells. <laughs> Should have been lifting them before we got in there. See? Yeah. I'm a big, strong, traveling man. Hey, Warden, how you like this? That's all right, Jeff. You keep it up. You never break through that wall. Yeah. yeah, and it's the same scenario. Same scenario. See? And that's another thing. I want to talk about... I hope I answered your question. See, they weren't aware. They weren't aware. See, they weren't aware of the danger. When a person comes in your midst who has a program, and you don't have no program, you're just walking around bumping into each other, showing out to each other, that's why I don't care nothing about tribalism. See, and that's the next thing on the burner in so-called South Africa. A person from Soweto told me this the other day. He said, the tribal thing is already warming up. So after they do the whole spectacular thing of Mr. Mandela and go that whole route, Black people are going to be killing each other in the streets of Johannesburg about my tribe. That's a bunch of foolishness. And he started telling me the differences between the tribes. I mean, that there are some pretty big differences. They ain't that big. See, I'm not buying that. See, that's what got the red people in trouble. See, I'm Sioux. You're Iroquois. I'm Blackfoot, Creek, Cherokee, Chickasaw, Seminole. And the racist walks in and say, I'm white man. <laughs> How you like them out? Well, we don't know what that means. We will. Yeah, real simple. Keep it neat. Don't clutter it all up. My tribe. See? My culture. My this, my that. Oh, yeah. You ever heard of white supremacy? Real simple. Racism, white supremacy. Greatest science on earth. Something shared by all in one form or another. Under me. Now, I saw, did I answer your question? Okay. Now, I have this lady right here. I'll get to you, sir. When you're in a work situation and you're dealing with an individual who are a Eurocentric person who believes that there's nothing wrong, and they never see the they never accept the fact that there is an addition and that they are perpetuating it. How do you combat that? You mean a person classified as white? Correct. And they'll always ask you questions about find something that you are relating to either in a book that's been written by a black man or anything. Okay. Because you're not going to have any of that. And when you explain it to them, they say, no, that's not the problem. They always decline to get too tight to legitimize the fact that it doesn't exist. What's the chief weapon of a, of a white supremacist? So you start with that, according to the code, counter-racist code. No, is deceit. Okay, how you combat that is simply, if a person, any person, black or white, asks you a question, answer the question truthfully. Now, if they say, taint so, you say, well, next question. Yeah, that's all you do. And just keep doing that. Every time... You know, they ask you a question, answer the question. See, don't worry about it. See? Then you can ask her questions sometime. I have a question for you, Miss Smitherman. <laughs> <laughs> Are you now? Or have you ever been? A racist. 
in any area of activity. And they will say, well, maybe she'll follow that up with a question. Well, what do you mean? Have you ever made a distinction in a harmful manner, because this is what makes a racist, between a white person and a non-white person with a distinction, harmful distinction, going against the non-white person? Because if you have, that makes you a racist, if you have. Now, I ask you a flat-out question. Have you ever... Or are you now been that or done that? Now, if the answer is no, accept that answer and then watch it. <laughs> so you didn't say, you know, you asked, you asked two things, a two-part question. Have you ever been? The old communist thing, you know? Or are you now or have you ever been a communist? See, of course, there was a hearing once, so somebody told me where that question was asked of a black person. Sir, are you now, or have you ever been, a communist? He looked right straight at you. So you're on the hot seat now. And the person, a black person, is, from what I heard, answered, you tell me what one is, and I'll tell you whether I am one or not. And the hearing broke up. <laughs> There are some words that do not have clear definitions, and that's one of them. This is why you talk about, you know, Maoism, Leninism, Marxism, Castroism. Yeah, Fatsiites, Titoism. You know, what all these isms mean? I don't know. It means dialectic materialism. Another ism. Yeah. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means the dictatorship of the proletariat. What does that mean? The working class. Well, everybody works, including a baby in a crib. See? So where did that class come from? See, that's another thing. See, all of these trick words. Watch them. The chief weapon of a racist is deceit, and the chief tool of deceit is words. So listen very carefully to everything the person says. What's going on here? Okay. <laughs> All right. Another, another question. I'll be throwing other things out. I'm going to try to move along. I, I, this gentleman here had his hand up a while ago. Yes, sir. Say so three things about religion. So you don't get in a big hassle. Black people get to hitting each other over the head with Bibles when you get into religion. <laughs> But once you start talking about religion, you are on a treadmill that is going to go on and on and on and on. Now, you want to get black people riled up and get a good fight started, see, start talking about religion. One person will stand up and say, well, look, in my church, Reverend Brown said, and I knew Reverend Brown, he wouldn't lie to me. See, he said, and in Thessalonians, and then somebody said, oh, sister, you don't know what you're talking about. Sit down. What you mean? Look. I mean, Christianity is the white man's religion, and you don't know what you're talking about, and you ought to sit down before you start misleading the people and disrupting the meeting, and I ain't putting you down, sister, but I mean, we just can't get sidetracked like this. Well, I mean, I got to tell you what Reverend Brown say. Well, look, sister, I am a black Buddhist. <laughs> See, so you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> now, here we go. And you have, you, you, ain't, you got yourself a mess. You might as well just wrap up what you got and leave, because that's going to go on forever. <laughs> you know it. See? Now, so, getting back to your question. What does the code say? you got to keep it clean. All right? So you cut everything with a nice, sharp knife. Three things about religion. When a person steps forward and says something about their religion, the first thing you want to know is, wait a minute, wait a minute, what's the name of your religion? And there's just three things on the agenda now. You want to talk about religion? Just three things. We're not going further than that. You've got to keep it codified. Keep it tight. What is the name of your religion, sir, ma'am? The name of my religion is Rocks on the Hillside. Okay. Don't argue with people about their religion. See, that's the basic. Don't argue with people about their religion. You ask the person the name of their religion. They told you. 
And don't giggle about it because it might be something monumental. It might be the religion that's going to save everything. Okay. You don't know. You don't know. Okay. Then you say, okay, rocks on the hillside. Okay. That's, that's it? Yeah, that's it. That's the title of the religion. As an interpretation, too, which I'll go into if you want to talk about it. Okay, well, number two. What does your religion require you to do in nine areas of activity? And then you name them. See, it's all through this code. This code is broken down into nine areas of activity. Economics, alphabetical order. Education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, other people's religions in this particular case, sex, and war. Now, that covers just about everything that everybody is involved in any minute of the day on this planet. So you ask the person, what does your religion require you to do? See, religions have rules. You want to know the rules of that person's religion. You got the name of it now. Now you want to know the rules of the religion, the laws. Then you go to the key question number three. What does your religion require you to do when you see me coming? and you come in contact with me in all of these nine areas of activity and ask him or her that and just let them tell you and that's all you want to know when they tell you this you know what to expect because that's all you want to know about anybody's religion anyway don't start getting into all the background about what the religion means eight million years ago that's irrelevant you want to know what it means right now between you and the person that's talking See, so when a person steps forward and says, I am a Jew, hold it right there. <laughs> you gave me the name of your religion. What does your religion require you to do in nine areas of activity? Economics, education, entertainment. See, now that's just generally speaking. Then you want to know, get personal. Since you are telling me about your religion, what does your religion require you to do when you relate to me? in all of these areas of activity. And hold it, sir, don't talk too fast. I want to get this down. <laughs> so, and will you sign it? Because these are your words. Because I don't want to be misinterpreted when I go around telling people what you told me. See? I want to put it right out there like, you know, if the person says they're Muslim, Hindu, Buddhists, don't argue with them. That's a no-no. The argument will go on forever. See, all you want to know is how the person is going to relate to you. That's their religion. Now, my religion, if you want to know what mine is, I'll just throw that out there. It is pluralism. Eclectic pluralism. Now, where is my church? You're looking at it. Wherever I happen to be. What does pluralism mean? It means I'm trying to find my way. See? I choose, pick and choose, you know, as I go along. Because I don't know very much. That way I'm never a hypocrite. Whatever you see me doing, I'm trying to find my way. <laughs> We're ready to wrap up. Oh, is that wrap up time? One, you want to All ask right. that one question about interracial marriages real quick, <laughs> and then we need to stop. Okay, we got interracial marriages how coming up. How our relationship, yeah. period, how does that fit into the, the code, and how would you respond to people? Because I find myself getting into debate, and it's not constructive about why we should not allow Europeans into our, our mm. communities. Okay. All right, under white supremacy, sexual intercourse between black people and white people and or any non-white people with white people should come to a complete worldwide halt. Wait a minute, but it's a reason. Until white supremacy is ended. Let's be reasonable. See, you put that ad, ad, ad addition on it. See, we don't know what we're doing. You don't go jumping in bed first when everybody says there's a war on. See? Let's put the horse before the cart. See that? And, and I, want to, I want to belabor this point just for a minute. Yes, sir. I just wanted to ask you one question. Okay, well, I'll get back with you. I, I, want, to, I want to drive this home because this might be important. See? Now, now, when you leave here, I'm saying the black female working in an office with a white man, just tell him that. 
say, look, uh, I've been going to some meetings lately, and just tell the truth. Always stick with truth. And some of the people are saying that we should have a moratorium, Hal. On <laughs> some of the black people are saying we should try this as an idea. Since all of this midnight rendezvousing is not getting anybody anywhere as far as coming up with a quality relationship. See, I don't like to use that term racial integration or nothing like that. I don't even use the term interracial sex because there's no such thing as that. We're talking about quality relationships. And what you don't have when a black male is in bed with a white female is a quality relationship because she's dominating him whether he knows it or not. When he gets up out of that bed, he might leave something there. But along with that, he leaves part of his thinking. And you can tell it when he gets up out of that bed and goes anywhere. He starts showing up in his conversation. He starts rationalizing racism. He can't help it because he had too much blonde hair in his eyes. <laughs> I mean, that's just the way it works. It works on your mind. The sex act is not a physical act alone. It's a mental act. Whoever you get in bed with will affect the way you think. You can't get away from that. See? Females definitely know that. And it's the same way with the black female out there wiggling and giggling with some white guy. You know? Oh, Hal likes me. He says I'm not like the rest of them. See? And then you're all back there on the desktops after closing time. With your legs up in there. See? And he's up there talking about, you know, he believes in all people are the same while he's hunching and punching. Okay? Now I'm saying, just simply walk up on the world scene and say, look, let's stop this nonsense until we clean up the mess. Hal, John, Ben, Susie, I know you like George, he's black, and all like that. I know what you've been doing, but let's just agree to stop all of this. I mean, just be up front. See, this is a business. Counter-racism is a business. You approach it just like that. Let's stop this nonsense until we clean up all this mess. Look at this mess. Look at the streets. Look at where black people reside. Look at the way we think. Look at the school situation. Look at all the areas of activity. Let's put sex last. I mean, that's, Elvis Presley once said, somebody asked him, why don't you get married? He said, why should I get married? Why should I buy the cow when I can get the milk through the fence? Now, we present the same thing, particularly to the white man. See? Say, wait a minute. Don't keep going in these black females coming out with these babies and blaming it on us and all the rest of the stuff that you do, along with AIDS, see, and blaming it on us, see, just... Get up off of her, and let's talk, and let's talk business. You, me, and her, or just you and her. She can talk for herself and say, look, you're not helping this situation, and us laying around doing all of this scenario of pretending that we are changing the world, and Pocahontas couldn't change it, laying around with Captain John, and all Beulah down there in the kitchen, back there on a sack of potatoes with Massa, that didn't change it. So let's put the sex last. That's all. See, this is nothing but reasonable. This is business. Just like any female will do with any male that walks up and pats her on the behind and say, let's go. Well, wait a minute. Let's do some talking first. You know, I got problems. Let's talk about problems first, and then we can do all kind of wiggling and giggling. But we don't put the wiggling and giggling first, because then you walk. Now, that's just pure logic. Clean up, eliminate racism first. Yeah. We don't have a we need to. They want to stop and let him autograph books. Okay, you can talk. You can ask questions. So people can start buying books. In the past six, six years, six or seven years, we've seen all of the Eastern Bloc nations knock down all of the different Japanese and the Korea and all this that come to Asia. Okay. In the last six to eight months, we've watched the Eastern and Western European white race. Not uh, uh, communism, socialism, democracy, and all that become a white race. What can we do to bring about some motives of change and the of the black race? Okay. One thing, 
If we want to get away from that word race, we don't want to be a race. We don't want to be a race. I want to get back to that. We are victims of racism. Keep that firmly in mind. If anybody asks you, are you a member of the black race, say, no, I am a black person. I'm not a racist. Race is racism. See, so remember that. And this is all you have to do is just become codified and answer to your question. In other words, what we're talking about right now, just all these little do's and don'ts, and I didn't get to most of them, got to about a fraction of them. See? And they just add up, and that'll do the job. Okay. Okay.